Chapter One, Part One of the Markets of Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Celine Major. The Markets of Paris by Emile Zola. Chapter One, Part One despair and hunger through the profound silence and loneliness of the deserted avenue the wagons of the market gardeners rolled slowly toward paris the measured rhythm of their wheels re-echoed from the facades of the sleeping houses on either side behind the confused outlines of their sheltering trees a cart loaded with cabbages and another with peas at the pont de neuilly joined eight more piled with carrots and turnips coming down from nanterre the horses moved on slowly by themselves with heads well down the drivers slept under the striped covering holding the reins lightly in their hands a gas jet would flash down occasionally on the shining nails of a stout shoe or the blue sleeve of a blouse light up the red carrots and white turnips and bring out the vivid green of the peas and the cabbages from all the roads came the dull continuous sound of wheels lulling the black town to a deeper sleep as they bore onward through the silence and darkness this vast supply of food balthazar the horse belonging to madame francois a stout heavy animal was at the head of the line he walked on at a steady pace though half asleep gently moving his ears when all at once at the head of la rue de longchamp he started and stood still firmly planted on his four feet the other animals did the same and the whole line came to a halt amidst the oaths of the awakened wagoners madame francois leaning against a board among her vegetables looked out but saw nothing for the scanty light of the small lantern fell only on balthazar's shining flanks well mother why don't you get on called out one of the men getting upon his knees among the turnips it is only some drunken man she leaned out of her wagon and saw on the right almost under the feet of the horse a black mass lying across the road i don't propose to drive over any one she said as she clambered over the wheel it was a man lying face downwards in the dust he seemed to be of a most extraordinary length as thin as a withered branch it was a miracle that balthazar had not broken him in two with one blow of his foot madame francois thought the man dead she knelt down by his side took his hand and felt that it was warm poor fellow she said gently but the wagoners were growing impatient and the one who had previously spoken now said in his thick voice give him a push mother he is pretty full that's all the trouble roll him over into the gutter the man opened his eyes he looked at madame francois in a wild sort of way but did not move she too thought him drunk you must not lie there she said you will be run over where are you going i do not know he replied in a low voice then he made an effort and added i was going into the city i fell and i do not know she saw him more distinctly now he was indeed most deplorable in appearance with his black and threadbare coat and pantaloons clinging closely to his emaciated form his cap also of black cloth pulled down over his brows showed two bright brown eyes of singular sweetness in a weary anxious face madame francois thought him too thin to be a drinking man and where were you going after you get into paris she asked he did not instantly reply he was evidently annoyed at this interrogatory he hesitated and then said slowly i was going to the Halles." he struggled to his feet with infinite difficulty and made an effort to continue his way the market woman saw him stagger and grasped the side of the wagon you are tired yes very tired he replied then she adopted a rough authoritative tone and said get into the wagon at once you are making us all lose our time i am going to the hall and i will take you with my vegetables and as he refused she lifted him with her stout strong arms and threw him among her turnips and carrots don't be a fool my good man don't i tell you that i am going to the hall go to sleep and i will wake you when we get there she climbed to her seat shook her reins a little as she gathered them up and balthazar calmly resumed his slow march the other wagons following the reverberations began anew and drivers fell asleep once more 
the one who had spoken stretched himself out and muttered i wonder if we are to pick up all the drunken men if that is your idea mother you will have enough to do the wagons rolled on the horses going as they pleased the man whom madame francois had rescued lay at full length among the vegetables half covered by the spreading carrot tops he clutched the side of the wagon with weak loose fingers lest he should be thrown out by a sudden jolt and looked out at the two interminable lines of gas-lights which afar off melted into other lights i am from nanterre i am called madame francois said the market-woman after a long silence since my old man died i go myself every morning to the halle tis hard work but i must grin and bear it i suppose and you my name is florent and i come from a great distance answered the unknown with some hesitation i beg your pardon but i am so very tired that it hurts me to speak he was evidently determined not to talk and she said no more but let the lines fall a little on balthazar's back as the animal knew every step of the way florent with his eyes riveted on the lights of paris thought of the history he hoped to conceal he had escaped from cayenne where he had been sent after these dark december days he had wandered for two years in guiana eager to return to his native land but afraid of the imperial police could it be that at last he saw the dear city for which he had so long pined he would hide himself there and live peaceably the police would have no reason to suspect him to them he was as good as dead he thought of his arrival at havre with fifteen francs tied up in the corner of his handkerchief at rouen he left the railroad as he had but thirty sous remaining and at vernon bought some bread with his last two sous after that he could remember nothing he thought he must have slept several hours in a ditch a gendarme had asked for his papers he remembered all this in a vague sort of way his head was dizzy for he had come from vernon without a mouthful clutching at times at the leaves of the hedges and chewing them in despair but he walked on in spite of cramps which nearly cut him in two drawn on by that image of paris waiting for him behind the distant horizon when he reached courbevoie the night was very dark paris like a streak of light falling athwart the blackness appeared to him severe and retreating as he crossed the pont de neuilly he leaned over the parapet and saw the seine rolling below in inky blackness between the dark banks from that point his progress was upward the avenue seemed absolutely endless to him the hundred of leagues he had toiled over became as nothing it was this last part of the road which drove him to desperation never would he reach that summit crowned by those lights the avenue with its tall trees and lower houses its grey pavement streaked with shadows the dark gaps made by the cross streets the silence and the blackness the yellow flaming gaslights at regular distances between the only suggestion of life weighed him down florent could not go on the avenue lengthened as he walked and paris was still farther off it seemed to him that the very gaslights were dancing to and fro he tottered and fell an inert mass on the sidewalk and now he was lying on this soft fresh verdure he raised his head a little to see a wider extent of the luminous mist that rose above the distant roofs he was going on without any exertion of his own and his only pain now arose from the pangs of hunger which had again awakened within him and were gnawing like wild animals the strong and penetrating odour of the carrots troubled him he turned over on his face and pressed his stomach against those piles of food hoping to still his cravings and behind were nine more huge wagons with their mountains of cabbages and peas their piles of artichokes and lettuce celery and leeks he wondered if they would fall upon him and stifle him with their abundance while he lay dying of hunger there was a sudden stop a great noise of voices they had reached the barrier and the custom-house people were examining the wagons florent entered paris among the carrots sound asleep hallo my good man cried madame francois and as he did not move she reached over and shook him he struggled up he was no longer hungry he was dizzy and faint the woman made him get down and then said you will help me unload won't you he helped her but a stout man with a cane and felt hat with a metal badge on his left breast became angry and knocked his cane against the pavement 
come come make haste that will never do you have four maitres haven't you he handed a paper to madame francois who drew from a linen bag the necessary sou and the man ordered the wagon to move on a little and then turned his grumbling to the next the market woman took balthazar by the bridle and pushed him back until the wheels ran up to the sidewalk she proceeded to mark her four maitres on the pavement with small bundles of straw then lifted the board at the back and begged florent to hand her out the vegetables bunch by bunch she arranged them methodically and with marvellous deftness so that the turnip carrot and beet tops framed her little square with a mass of verdure and the whole looked in the shadow like a rich carpet when florent handed her a huge bundle of parsley the last thing in the wagon she asked him yet one other service would you be so kind as to watch my merchandise while i put up my horse i have only two steps to go just round the corner to the compadre in la rue montorgueil he assured her that she might make her mind easy he had as lief stay there as not until her return the fact was that he preferred to stay still for hunger began to gnaw at his vitals the moment he moved he sat down and leaned against a pile of cabbages telling her she might be as long as she pleased his head was dizzy and he did not feel quite certain where he was as soon as september comes the early morning is dark and lanterns were moving about held in invisible hands he was at the end of a wide street with which he was perfectly unfamiliar ten steps away was all thick darkness and he could see no farther than the merchandise over which he was keeping guard confused grey masses occupied the centre of the street and he heard the sound of cattle moving and breathing loud a quiet imperative call the fall of a piece of wood on an iron chain on the stone pavement the dull thud of a wagon backed up against the curbstone filled the air with vague suggestions of a formidable awakening near at hand an awakening with which all this darkness already shivered florent turning his head saw on the other side of the pile of cabbages a man sound asleep with his head on a basket of prunes nearer still was a lad of twelve curled up between two piles of chicory but he fixed his eyes in dull surprise on two gigantic covered sheds on either side the street whose roofs seemed to expand as he gazed his mind slightly wandered and he began to dream of an endless palace light and airy brilliantly illuminated he saw the slender pillars and the overhanging roof he tried to count the succession of halls crowded with people he turned his head aside restless and uneasy and suddenly beheld the illuminated clock-face of saint eustache and the grey mass of the church he was excessively astonished at finding himself in this locality madame francois now appeared she was disputing with a man who carried a sack on his shoulders and wished to buy her carrots at one sou a bunch but there is no sense in it lacaille you will sell them again for four or five sous to the parisians you know that as well as i do you can have them for two sous if you say so and as the man went away she said that is really too much he won't find any carrots at a sou but he is tipsy there is no use in talking about him he will be back soon enough too she was speaking to florent and then she took a seat by his side tell me she said if you have been a long time away from paris for if you have this market is new to you the halles have been built not more than five years all this building on your right is devoted to flowers and fruits next comes the fish and the poultry and beyond the vegetables cheese butter etc there are six buildings on this side of the street and on the other four tripe and meat and all that sort of thing it is an enormous place and hideously cold in winter they say that there are two more divisions to be built and a number of houses to be torn down all the way from the wheat market you know where that is no answered florent i am quite a stranger but what is the name of this wide street just before us it is a new street la rue du pont neuf which runs from the seine there is la rue montmartre and there is la rue montorgueil she rose as she spoke seeing a woman leaning over her turnips good morning mother chantemesse she said in a friendly way florent looked at la rue montorgueil it was there that he had been arrested by armed police on the night of the fourth of december he was walking along the street about two o'clock feeling a certain contempt for all these soldiers that the elysee had sent forth 
when all at once these soldiers swept the streets with the discharge of musketry he himself fell at the corner of la rue vivienne he knew no more the crowd trampled upon him and the noise was deafening when all was again silent he tried to rise to his feet again the body of a young girl lay across him she wore a rose-coloured hat and her shawl had slipped off showing a muslin waist all tucks and inserting two musket balls had gone through her throat and when he lifted the poor thing his hands were drenched with blood then he rushed away mad with horror and wandered until night seeing nothing but this young girl with her pale face and her great blue eyes wide open in which he read a great surprise surprise at death coming to her so suddenly he was very timid and although thirty rarely looked into a woman's face and yet this one would haunt him all the rest of his life that evening without knowing how he got there he found himself at a wine-shop in the rue montorgueil the men were all talking of erecting some barricades he went with them and assisted them in tearing up the paving stones and then seated himself for he was weary with the excitement of the day he had not even a knife in his belt and his head was bare he bade his friends to tell him if the soldiers came as he was ready to do his share of fighting about eleven o'clock he fell asleep but his dreams were haunted by those blue eyes and the two round holes in that white throat when he awoke he was in the grasp of four armed men his friends had taken flight the police wished to strangle him at once when they saw that he had blood on his hands it was the blood of the blue-eyed girl florent absorbed in these recollections watched the illuminated dial in the tower of saint eustache but he saw neither figures nor hands it was nearly four o'clock the halle was not yet well astir madame chantemet still bargained with madame francois over the price of the turnips and florent recalled what he had seen in that very spot five dead bodies had lain there five poor fellows who had been taken at a barricade in la rue Grenetta. he had not been shot down at the same time and place merely because the men who took him prisoner had swords instead of guns he was taken to a station near by where his description was filed hands covered with blood when arrested very dangerous he was dragged from station to station at each the same words were written down he was handcuffed and treated as if he were a madman at one place some tipsy soldiers wished to shoot him but fortunately orders came that all prisoners should be carried before the prefect the next day he was placed in a casemate of the fort de bicetre that day he suffered from hunger for the first time in his life and eagerly snatched the mouthfuls of food which were thrown into him as to a wild beast when he appeared before the judge without any testimony in his favour or counsel to defend him he was accused of belonging to a secret society and when he swore that this was not true the judge with a portentous frown drew out the ominous bit of paper hands covered with blood when arrested very dangerous this was enough he was tried and condemned at the end of six weeks in january a jailer came to him in the middle of the night and took him down to a courtyard where there were at least four hundred other prisoners and in another hour the first detachment of these were sent into exile wearing handcuffs and marching between two files of soldiers with loaded guns they crossed the pont d'austerlitz following the line of the boulevards and reached the havre station it was a gay and festive night of the carnival the windows of all the restaurants on the boulevard were blazing with lights and near la rue vivienne just where the dead girl had lain florent saw some masked women in a carriage who were much disgusted at being detained by all these forçats who would never get past from paris to havre the prisoners had not a mouthful of bread nor a drop of water no rations had been distributed before they started they were forgotten they had nothing to eat for thirty-six hours not until they were on board the frigate canada as he looked back he could not remember that he had had enough to eat once since then he was nothing but skin and bone and now he returned to paris to find her rolling in abundance he had come back to her borne upon a cart heaped high with vegetables that carnival night on which he had left paris had apparently lasted until now for seven long years 
and it seemed to him that all the glitter and prodigality of that night as he remembered it had blossomed out into this enormous market mother chantemesse decided to buy twelve bunches of turnips she held them in her apron and still stood talking when she at last departed madame francois went back and took a seat by florent saying the poor old woman is over seventy i was a child when she bought turnips of my father and she has not a relative in the world nor a soul to do a thing for her except a girl she has picked up somewhere the old woman gets along somehow though and even makes her forty sous per day but dear me i wonder how she can stay all the time in these paris streets they would kill me and as florent did not speak she said you have relations here i suppose he did not seem to hear her he was uneasy and suspicious his head was full of stories of police agents and detectives watching at all the corners of the streets of women selling the secrets they tore from certain poor devils he looked at madame Francoise's kindly face framed in a black and yellow handkerchief tied under her chin she was apparently about thirty-five rather large and masculine but handsome from her abundant health and out-of-doors life softened by the womanly tenderness which spoke from out her black eyes she went on not in the least offended by the silence of her companion i have a nephew in paris but he has turned out badly i suppose your parents will be surprised to see you ah it is a nice thing to go home when one is sure of a welcome is it not she did not take her eyes from him as she spoke she was compassionating his excessive thinness but detecting a gentleman under his shabby clothing she did not dare to offer him the piece of silver which was burning her hand at last she said timidly if in the meantime you should happen to want anything but he refused with uneasy pride he said he had all he needed and that he knew where to go she seemed quite pleased and said over and over again as if to reassure herself well then you have only to wait for daylight a great bell above florent's head now began to ring with a slow and regular sound carts were rolling up the shouts of the drivers and the snapping of their whips the grinding of the gravel beneath the wheels and the feet of the animals momentarily increased the wagons could now advance only a rod or two at a time so great was the crowd all along la rue du pont neuf the carts stood against the sidewalk and were unloading the horses with their heads close together florent took a special interest in an enormous load of cabbages on which shone a gas light bringing out the green of the large leaves looking like wrinkled velvet a little peasant girl of sixteen wearing a blue jacket and a close-fitting cap stood upright in the cart among the cabbages and threw them one by one to some person standing in the shadow below the girl was sometimes almost hidden among the verdure then her pretty rosy face peeped out again she laughed and the cabbages recommenced their flight between the gaslight and florent he counted them mechanically and was sorry when the cart was empty the vegetables were so arranged on the pavement that the vendors could circulate among them the lights from the glancing lantern shone on a bundle of artichokes on the delicate green of lettuce the deep orange of the carrots and the ivory whiteness of turnips all these brilliant colors were repeated again and again until the whole ground was like a delicious mosaic the crowd was rapidly increasing customers were moving in every direction a loud voice called nice chicory fresh chicory the proprietors of the vegetable stalls women with their white caps and fichus knotted loosely and with their skirts pinned up carefully were making their purchases which porters were carrying to the stalls and there was much noisy disputing over a sou florent was infinitely astonished at the calmness of these hale countrywomen with their sunburned faces and madras handkerchiefs in the presence of these voluble parisians behind him was the fruit market rows of low shallow baskets stood covered with cloth or straw while an odour of overripe plums filled the air a low sweet voice compelled him to look around he saw a charmingly pretty woman small and dark bargaining with a man well then marcel will you sell them for a hundred sous the man made no reply and the young woman waited fully five minutes when she said a hundred sous for this basket and four francs for the other make nine that i owe you another silence 
what then am i to give you ten francs just as i told you and jules what have you done with him la Sarriette? the woman laughed and said as she showed a handful of money bless your heart jules is asleep he vows that men were not made to work she paid him and took the two baskets into the fruit market which had just opened through its covered streets a crowd was constantly passing while at the point saint eustache the bakers and proprietors of other small shops were just taking down their shutters and their windows lighted by gas made little red spots among the grey houses laurent looked to the left way down la rue montorgueil and saw the glossy brown loaves in the window and fancied that he could even smell them it was now half past four all this time madame francois was getting rid of her merchandise and had nothing left but some bunches of carrots when lacaille appeared again with his sack will you take a sou for them now he asked i was sure you would be back answered the market woman quietly you can have all that are left only seventeen bunches that makes seventeen sous no thirty-four they finally agreed on twenty-five as madame francois was in a hurry to get away and lacaille went off quite triumphant with his carrots in his sack old miser she said to flora he always waits until the last sound of the bell to buy his four sous worth of stuff ah these parisians they bargain their eyes out for two liards and then go and drink up every sou they own at the first wine shop when madame francois spoke of paris she was full of irony and contempt she seemed to regard it as a most contemptible as well as ridiculous city in which she would not consent to spend a night and now she said with a sigh of relief as she again seated herself by florent now i can go florent looked away for he had committed a theft he had picked up a carrot and held it concealed in his hand the parsley and celery emitted such fragrance that his hunger became unendurable i am going away repeated madame francois she was interested in this stranger and was certain that he was suffering she made him new proffers of assistance but he refused them all with a certain sharpness in his voice he rose to his feet to prove that he was quite able to go on his way and as she turned away her head he put a piece of the carrot in his mouth he held it there a moment as she looked him once more in the face with several new questions he nodded and ate the carrot slowly End of chapter one part one Chapter One, Part Two of the Markets of Paris by Emile Zola. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Despair and Hunger, Part Two. The market woman turned to depart when a full voice called out, "Good morning, Madame Francois." It was a thin fellow who spoke, a thin fellow with a big head and big bones, a delicate nose, and small bright eyes. He wore a hat of black felt, shabby and out of shape. He was closely buttoned up in an immense overcoat, once light chestnut in tint, on which the rain had left huge greenish blotches. Round-shouldered and trembling in a nervous way that was probably habitual, he stood with his legs a little apart, his stout lace shoes and blue stockings fully exposed to view by his very short pantaloons. "'Good morning, Monsieur Claude,' replied the market woman gaily. "'I waited for you Monday, and as you did not come, I took care of your canvas, and fastened it up on my wall in my bedroom.' you are very kind madame francois i will come some day and finish my sketch monday it was impossible has your great prune tree put out all its leaves yet oh yes indeed well then i will put it in the corner of my picture it will do well there next the poultry house i have been thinking about it all the week the vegetables are superb this morning i got up early only to see the effect of the sunrise on these cabbages i am off said the market woman i hope to see you soon monsieur claude she hesitated and then added presenting florent to the young painter look here this gentleman has just come back from a long journey and feels like a stranger in paris give him some help can't you and she walked off quite content in leaving the two men together claude looked at florent with interest his long oval face with its uncertain expression struck him as quite original the market woman's introduction was quite enough and with the ease of a person accustomed to all sorts of odd adventures and rencontres he said quietly 
i will go with you but where are you going florent was not altogether pleased but one question had been on his lips for the last hour and he determined to risk it he hastily said does la rue pirouette still exist to be sure answered the painter and a curious corner of old paris it is too with its crooked turns and pot-bellied houses i made a sketch there that was not very bad when you come to my studio i will show it to you is that where you want to go florent quite comforted by hearing that la rue pirouette still existed said no that he was not going there all his distrust was awakened by claude's persistence who answered gaily well never mind let us go all the same to la rue pirouette come it is only two steps off there was nothing to be said and florent was compelled to yield and they strode off along the sidewalk were gigantic piles of cauliflowers arranged with surprising regularity their tender green among the coarser outer leaves gave them the look of flowers or of a succession of bridal bouquets claude stopped before them with a little exclamation of admiration a gaslight still burned on the corner of la rue pirouette the houses were precisely as the painter had described them pot-bellied and elbowing each other although some few were quite the contrary and looked as if they were about to fall on their noses the gas fell full on one which was very white and fresh as if it had recently been done up while others were tottering and covered with green mould florent stood still at the corner of la rue mondetour in front of the house next to the corner on the left the three floors looked as if all the inhabitants were still sound asleep the small white curtains were drawn close while high up in an attic window a light came and went but the shop on the lower floor seemed to cause florent an extraordinary emotion it was a place where only cooked vegetables were sold at the back bright tins glittered and on the counter stood chicory and spinach smoking in small earthen dishes where they were piled up in smooth hillocks this sight seemed to astonish florent he looked up at the name godeboeuf on a red sign and stood aghast with the air of a man to whom some great misfortune has arrived meanwhile the attic window was opened a little old woman leaned out looked at the sky then at the hall and then into the distance hallo mademoiselle saget is early to-day said claude turning toward his companion i once had an aunt living in that house which is a perfect nest for scandal ah the mehudons are moving i see their lights on the second floor florent was about to ask a question but suddenly changed his mind for he did not feel quite easy each time he looked the little artist full in the face he therefore listened while the other talked of the mehudons they were fishwomen the oldest was superb the youngest looked like one of murillo's virgins calm and fair among her carp and her eels and then the little painter added angrily that murillo was not such a wonderful artist after all he suddenly stood still in the middle of the street well he asked do you want to go to the very end i don't care where i go said florent lead on i will follow as they turned out of la rue pirouette a voice called claude from the depths of a wine-shop in the corner claude went in dragging florent with him the shutters were taken down from only one window the gas was burning and the air close and stifling a dirty towel and the cards of the previous evening lay forgotten on the table fluttering in the breeze which came in at the open door and mingled with the stale odour of wine and tobacco the proprietor le bigre was waiting on his customers in his shirt-sleeves and with his big face white with sleep men were drinking at the counter coughing and spitting swallowing raw brandy with the hope of arousing themselves to their day's work florent saw lacaille the man who had bargained for the carrots and was now discussing with a comrade the price of potatoes when he had emptied his glass he went into a small room at the back of the shop with le bigre what will you take said claude to florent the little painter had shaken hands and he came in with the young man who had called him a handsome young fellow of about twenty-two wearing a moustache on his otherwise well-shaven face which smiled from under the wide brim of a hat well dusted with chalk claude called him alexander tapped him familiarly on the arm and asked when they should go to charentonneau and they said something about a jolly boating party on which they had been together and of a delicious rabbit stew they had enjoyed in the evening well what will you take repeated claude florent looked at the counter in some doubt 
at one end were bowls of punch and hot wine kept hot over gas he said he would take something warm m lebigre handed over the counter three glasses of punch a basketful of hot rolls stood on the counter but as the other two men did not take any florent refrained although he felt the hot punch fall into his empty stomach like so much melted lead it was alexander who paid a good fellow is this alexander said claude when they left the wine shop he is excellent company in the country i never saw such a gymnast his muscles are something extraordinary he has posed for me naked several times in the open air now shall we take a turn through the hall florent followed him at the end of la rue rambuteau a bright light announced the coming of the day the roar of the crowd in the market was constantly increasing the two men turned into one of those covered streets between the fish and the poultry market florent lifted his eyes to the high roof with its cross timbers of shining wood and then as he looked about him it seemed to him that he was in some big town with its distinct quartier its squares and its streets all put under a huge shed out of some whim on a rainy day there was a perfect forest of pillars and innumerable trellises of iron some of the divisions were as yet unoccupied although the gas was lighted throughout women were hurrying through the fish market and laying out their wares on the marble tables the hurry and noise was spreading from the poorer quarters where the cabbages were bought and sold at four o'clock in the morning to the stalls where pheasants and chickens were sold to the wealthy at eight o'clock all along the sidewalks were established petty market gardeners from the outskirts of the city with their bunches of vegetables and dainty baskets of fruit carts were constantly driving in under the vaulted roof two of these stood in such a way that florent was obliged to wait for them to move before he could pass and he saw the men take down heavy bags which were wet and smelt of sea moss and contained shellfish as did huge boxes with crossbars of wood which were brought by the railroads daily from the ocean then came large yellow wagons with coloured lanterns laden with cheese eggs and butter claude was delighted with all this tumult he was transfixed by an effect of light on a group of men in blouses at last they struggled through all this confusion and found themselves in a quieter spot filled with delicious fragrance they were among cut flowers women were seated on either side of them with their square baskets full of roses violets and marguerites a lighted candle brought out a perfect melody of colour the pale sweetness of the marguerite and the vivid crimson of the dahlias and the flesh-like tints of the roses there is nothing sweeter or more spring-like than this odour of flowers coming to one after the smell of fish and the pestilential odour of cheese and butter claude and florent loitered along among the flowers and stopped with some curiosity before the women who sold bundles of ferns and of vine leaves methodically bound together twenty-five in a bundle then they turned into another quiet street which was almost deserted where their steps resounded as in a church they found there harnessed to a wagon about as large as a wheelbarrow the smallest donkey that was ever seen the creature began to bray as soon as the two men came in sight and with such prolonged vigour that the vast roof of the hall fairly reverberated horses neighed in response and these sounds were repeated again and again until lost in the distance opposite was the rue berger with its wide open stalls heaped up with baskets and with fruit near by stood a fiacre in which they caught a glimpse of a lady lounging in the corner while her driver swore at the carts in which he found himself hopelessly entangled it is cinderella coming home without her slipper said claude with a smile the two men talked a little as they lounged through the market claude with his hands in his pockets told how much he enjoyed seeing all this abundance which poured into paris every morning he said he never came without his imagination being filled with wonderful pictures of which he had yet begun only one he had made marjolin and cadine sit for him but the deuce of it all was that these vegetables fruits meat and fish were mighty hard things to paint florent listened while the pangs of hunger were devouring him to this enthusiasm it was plain that claude at this moment did not think of these things as edible he liked them for their beauty and colour claude suddenly stopped and tightened in a way that was common with him the wide leather belt he wore under his old overcoat and said with a knowing air 
sometimes my only breakfast is through my eyes and when i have neglected to dine the evening before this sort of breakfast does not agree with me he then went on to describe a supper for which a friend had once paid at barat's they had had oysters fish and game but barat had come to grief he and the old marché des innocents were done for together this vast halle was a very poor substitute for the past florent did not know whether the artist most regretted the loss of what was picturesque or the good cheer that once was to be got at barat's claude was now launched he delivered a fiery vituperation of all the old masters his cabbages he declared were better than all their dingy rags he ended by accusing himself of miserable mannerism in the study he had made of la rue pirouette i tell you he said a man should paint what he sees and as he sees it now look there he continued is not that a better picture than their consumptive saints women were selling coffee and soup a small crowd of customers had gathered around a large kettle of cabbage soup which smoked on a tiny brazier the woman armed with a long ladle first put into a yellow bowl thin slices of bread which she took from a basket covered with a napkin and then filled up the bowl with soup there were clean market gardeners in blouses dirty porters with their shoulders soiled by the burthens they had carried poor devils in rags in short all sorts of persons eating their breakfast and scalding themselves with the hot soup the painter was delighted and half shut his eyes to compose his picture but the smell of the cabbage soup was terribly strong florent turned away his head the sight of the appetizing bowls made him dizzy and even claude was affected he tightened his belt with a smile but he was a little vexed and walked on saying as he did so in a low voice to florent it is very funny but did you ever notice that there are always plenty of people ready to pay for a drink for you but no one ever thinks of such a thing as paying for your food it was now dawn at the end of la rue de la cossonnerie the houses in the boulevard sebastopol were black and above their slated roofs stretched a line of light claude was looking up with his eyes fixed on a roof over his head what are you looking for asked florent or that devil of a marjolin answered the painter i need him for a study he is certainly up there unless he has seen fit to spend the night in a cellar with the poultry and he went on to say how his friend marjolin always lived about the market of which he knew every nook and corner he and that little scamp of a cadine whom mother chantemesse had picked up one night in the old marché des innocents he was a splendid great fellow with a ruddy beard which would have gladdened the heart of rubens while she was a tiny creature with a quaint little face and bright eyes under a wilderness of curly hair claude as he talked increased his pace he led his companion to the point saint eustache where he dropped on a bench near the omnibus station a ray of light suffused the eastern sky which overhead was sombre and grey and the air had such aromatic freshness that florent could fancy himself on a hillside in the country claude pointed out to him the secret of this odour thyme and lavender sweet marjoram and basil were all around him done up in bundles ready for sale the illuminated dial of saint eustache was slowly fading while in the wine shops the gas burners were being extinguished one by one and florent watched the halle emerge from the shadow stretching their endless length before him and when the daylight brought them entirely into view they struck him as a wonderful machine the result of modern ingenuity a gigantic cauldron made of wood metal and glass claude stood upon a bench and insisted on his companion admiring the light as it streamed over the vegetables bringing out all their rich tints and varied shades of green the cabbages alone were a study for an artist enormous white cabbages hard and compact as if made of metal curled cabbages with leaves like bronze red cabbages with streaks of rich purple and crimson in the distance the opening to la rue rambuteau was barred by a barricade of orange-coloured pumpkins and the glossy reddish-brown of a basket of onions the vivid red of a pile of tomatoes the yellowish tone of a quantity of cucumbers the sombre violet of the eggplants delighted the heart of the artist who called these vegetables simply sublime meanwhile the crowd of white caps and blue blouses filled the narrow paths porters lifted their burthens high above their heads there was a soldier and several nuns buying cabbages 
and stout cooks were peering about in search of bargains and the carts were still roaring up the street is it not magnificent cried claude but florent was in an agony of pain he looked up at saint eustache of which he saw the sides like sepia tracings against the blue sky he saw the beautiful windows the bell tower and the slated roof he caught the gleam of gold-lettered signs in la rue montmartre down which workmen in white blouses with their tools under their arms were hurrying claude was still standing on the bench suddenly he beheld in the crowd a head he knew ah marjolet cadine he cried his voice was lost in the uproar and he jumped down to follow his friends but suddenly remembering florent he said quickly you will find me in the impasse des bourdonnais my name is on the door claude lantier come and see my sketch of la rue pirouette he disappeared he did not know florent's name he left him as he had taken him on the curbstone having explained his artistic preferences florent was now alone at first he was glad of it since madame francois had picked him up in the avenue de neuilly he had been simply half awake and yet in such pain that he had hardly known what he was doing at last he was free and he tried to rid himself of the intolerable and heavy dream of mountains of food by which he felt himself pursued but his head had a strangely empty feeling he was a little afraid withal for he could now be seen his clothing was lamentable he buttoned up his coat brushed his pantaloons fearing that their very dust would betray whence he came he was seated by the side of several other poor devils on a bench which was kept in view by several policemen who were walking up and down florent fancied that they knew him and were about to arrest him he felt a mad desire to run but he did not dare to move nor had he the smallest idea where he should go but he felt that he could no longer endure this cold examination of these men and left the bench not hurriedly but as quietly as possible feeling in imagination rough hands laid upon his collar he had but one desire now and that was to get away from les halles but the streets were all so crowded that he did not know which to take wherever he turned his path was encumbered by the vegetables while the pavement was slippery with the leaves of artichokes and lettuce he heard the noise from the hall it was like a great central organ furiously beating throwing the blood of life through all its veins he went into a quiet covered street at the left which he had previously noticed as especially quiet but it was now as noisy and bustling as the others he went to the very end where he found cages of living poultry and baskets of dressed fowls on the opposite sidewalk were carts discharging whole calves and calves in quarters sheep and quarters of beef butchers with white aprons were weighing and cutting up the meat he looked at them with wild hungry eyes he passed the stall where tripe was sold and the feet and heads of calves with the brains delicately placed in flat baskets sweetbreads and kidneys florent with sullen rage in his heart turned away from this place his teeth chattered and he was afraid he should fall on the ground and be picked up and carried off by the police he stopped and leaned against a tree with his eyes closed and a strange buzzing in his ears the raw carrot he had swallowed gripped his stomach and the glass of punch intoxicated him he was drunk with despair fatigue and hunger a great fire burned within his breast he pressed his two hands upon it as if to stop a hole through which his life was ebbing the sidewalk upheaved under his feet when he tried once more to walk he staggered and finally in a stupor allowed himself to be pushed first in one direction and then in another he was now ready to beg and angry with himself at his foolish pride in rejecting the alms offered by madame francois and he was vexed also that he had not asked the painter to give him something for now there was no one to whom he could turn he was left there like a lost dog he looked toward the hall once more they were now bright with the blaze of the rising sun the zinc roof reflected the light blinded and dizzy he wondered if he were to die in the face of all this plenty hot tears stood in his eyes two women now passed him a little old woman and a taller one and you come yourself to market mademoiselle saget asked the taller and younger of the two 
oh madame le coeur my marketing is nothing you know what one woman lives on is nothing i wanted a little cauliflower but they are so dear and butter how much do they ask for it to-day thirty-four sous i have some very good suppose you try some i don't know i have a little on hand florent made a great effort and followed these women he remembered that he had heard the smaller one mentioned by claude and said to himself that he would speak to her as soon as she was alone and your niece asked mademoiselle saget la sarriette has her own way answered madame le coeur sharply the day will come that she will turn to me for a mouthful of bread but she will ask in vain you were very good to her always she ought to make money for fruits are very advantageous this year and your brother-in-law oh he madame le coeur pinched up her lips and seemed determined to say no more always the same i suppose continued mademoiselle saget but he is a good man after all though it is a pity that he wastes his money in such a way how does he waste his money answered madame le coeur fiercely he is a miser i tell you and a thief too he would let me starve rather than give me a five-franc piece he knows perfectly well that i have made no money this year while he has sold all the poultry he could get hold of but he has never once offered me the smallest assistance not that i would have accepted it you understand ah here he comes said mademoiselle saget lowering her voice the two women turned and looked at a man who was crossing the street i am in a hurry said madame le coeur i left my stall without any one and besides i do not wish to speak to him florent looked around mechanically he saw a small squarely built man with rather a happy face holding under each arm a fat goose he started looked again and started in pursuit of this man when he reached him he touched him on his shoulder gavard he said the other looked up in some surprise at this long black figure which accosted him then he uttered a stifled exclamation you he cried you here he nearly let his fat geese slip from his grasp but seeing his sister and mademoiselle saget watching this meeting with evident curiosity he walked on saying do not stop here there are too many eyes and ears they found a quiet corner and talked florent said he had been to la rue pirouette gavard thought this very queer he laughed and said that quenu had moved and opened his pork-shop in la rue rambuteau opposite the halle he was still more amused when he discovered that florent had been all the morning with claude lantier a droll sort of fellow who was moreover the nephew of madame quenu he would show florent where the pork-shop was but when gavard found that his friend had returned to paris with forged papers he shook his head with an air of grave disapproval he insisted on going a little in front as they walked that they might not attract attention he passed his stall and hung up his two fat geese and still followed by florent he crossed la rue rambuteau where he pointed to a showy pork-shop past which the army of street sweepers were just moving with regular strokes of their brooms the pork-shop was almost on the corner of la rue pirouette it was a pleasure to look at being so bright and clean the sign on which was the name quenu gradel in long gilt letters on a pale blue ground was worthy of being covered with glass cupids sported amid wreaths of sausages and piles of cutlets the window was a mass of green each plate was surrounded by parsley and celery in the background were jars of pickles and pots of mustard there were hams and tongues and pigs feet black puddings and forcemeat balls sausages and pâtés hams and jelly and large pâtés there were truffles and mushrooms there were boxes of tunny-fish and sardines a box of rich neufchatel cheeses in one corner and in the other fat little snails lay among parsley on the rear shelf of this chapel consecrated to the stomach between two tall bouquets of purple gladioli was a square aquarium wherein two goldfish were disporting florent shivered he saw a woman standing in the doorway she gave another touch of beauty to all this solid comfort she was a beautiful woman full but not too stout in all the maturity of her thirty years she had just risen and her shining hair was smooth and massive her flesh had that transparent whiteness 
that delicacy common to the skin of persons who live on buttermilk and fat meat she was grave and serious in expression her stiff linen collar lay smooth about her throat her white sleeves came up to her elbows and her white apron down nearly to her shoes leaving only the extreme edge of her black dress to be seen and its tight-fitting waist she stood bathed in the sunshine drinking in the beauty of the morning she had a look of great kindliness that is your brother's wife your sister-in-law lisa said gavard to florent he nodded to the woman as he spoke then turned into an alley taking the most preposterous precautions although the shop was empty and was evidently delighted to be concerned in an adventure which he regarded as somewhat compromising wait he said i am going to see if your brother is alone you must not go in until i clap my hands he pushed a door open in the alley but when florent heard his brother's voice he could restrain himself no longer but rushed in quenu who adored him advanced with open arms they embraced each other as if they had been children ah stammered quenu and i thought you dead only just now i was saying to lisa that poor florent he stopped and put his head into the shop lisa lisa then turning to a little girl in the corner he said pauline go ask your mother to come here but the child did not move she was a magnificent little creature about five years old and looking very much like her mother she held tight in her plump little arms an enormous yellow cat as if afraid that this shabby newcomer would steal her treasure lisa came with slow and stately step it is florent my brother said quenu she called him monsieur and was very cordial she examined him frankly from head to foot but evinced no unkind surprise her lips were however slightly compressed but they finally parted in a smile as she witnessed her husband's ecstasy of delight but he suddenly became grave seeming to realize florent's careworn aspect and his excessive thinness ah my poor dear boy he said you have not grown fat now look at me he was fat certainly too fat for his thirty years he seemed to be bursting out of his shirt and the great white apron in which he was swathed his well-shorn face had gained a certain resemblance to that of a pig in the flesh of which animals' hands were busy all day long florent would hardly have recognized him he seated himself and looked from his brother to lisa and then to little pauline they were all in riotous health and gazed at him with all the astonishment of stout persons at excessive thinness the very cat winked her yellow eyes and examined him with evident distrust will you wait a while for breakfast asked quenu or will you have something now our hour is ten florent thought of the terrible night he had passed of his agony and of the incessant sight of the abundance of which he could not partake and said in a low voice with a sweet smile i am very hungry End of chapter one chapter two of the markets of paris by emile zola this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two the miser's treasure part one florent had just begun the study of law in paris when his mother died she lived at vigan dans la gare she had married a second time a normand a connu of yoteau whom a sub-prefect had brought and forgotten in the south he remained at the prefecture finding the country charming the wine good and the woman kind an indigestion three years after his marriage carried him off and he left to his wife a stout boy much like himself but not a sou the mother was then paying with great difficulty her son florent's way in college he was the child of her first marriage and gave her great satisfaction he was very industrious and ambitious and carried off all the prizes it was on him that she concentrated all her tenderness and all her hopes perhaps she had preferred her first husband perhaps quenu whose good humour had first charmed her was too much absorbed in himself she at all events made up her mind that her youngest boy would never amount to much she contented herself with sending him to school to an old woman in the neighbourhood where the child learned a little or nothing the two brothers grew up far from each other and almost as strangers when florent arrived at vigan his mother was buried she had concealed her illness as long as possible that she might not disturb him at his studies 
he found little quenu then about twelve sobbing in the kitchen a neighbour told him all the melancholy details his mother had literally killed herself with work that her son might pursue his studies to her little shop where she sold ribbons she added other toil which kept her up early and late the fixed idea of seeing florent a lawyer rendered her hard exacting and pitiless toward herself and others little quenu went about with ragged clothing and never dared help himself at table his mother always cut his bread for him and cut it very thin too it was to this regime that she had succumbed with immense despair at leaving her task incomplete the history made a terrible impression on the tender nature of florent his tears choked him he took his young brother in his arms and kissed him as if to assure him of the affection with which he should always regard him he looked at the little fellow's shoes and holes jacket and rags and at his generally neglected air and told him that he was to go with him and that they would be happy together the next day he found that he had not money enough to return to paris but was determined not to remain at vigan he therefore gladly sold out the little ribbon shop which enabled him to pay his mother's small debts and the neighbour offered him five hundred francs for the linen and entire household possessions of the deceased the neighbour made a good bargain but the young man thanked him with tears in his eyes and that evening dressed his brother in new garments he was compelled to give up his law studies for the time and on his return to paris established himself with quenu in la rue royer collard in a large room which he furnished with two iron beds a wardrobe and four chairs he regarded his brother as his child and at first when he came home in the evenings attempted to teach the child but the lessons did no good the boy absolutely refused to learn anything sobbed and wished his mother were back and he could play in the streets all day long florent in despair gave up the lessons consoled him and promised an indefinite vacation and to excuse his weakness in his own eyes he said to himself that he had taken the child only to make him happy this was florent's rule of conduct now to sacrifice everything that quenu might be happy the elder brother absolutely adored the younger basked in his smiles and laughed when he laughed and enjoyed the boys growing up with no care or fear for the future florent had a few scholars but the task of teaching wore heavily upon him he grew thinner and thinner each day while quenu was as plump as a partridge and barely knew how to read and write but with a good nature which filled with gaiety that old room in la rue royer gollard years went on florent who had inherited from his mother the spirit of self-sacrifice cherished quenu as if he had been a great indolent girl he even avoided imposing on him any of their small household cares it was he who went out for their provisions he who cooked them and he who kept the room clean it takes me out of myself said florent who was very gloomy at times when he came in at night body and mind utterly weary hating the children he had been teaching he was touched by the joy of this big boy whom he generally found playing top in the centre of the floor quenu laughed at his awkwardness in making an omelette and at the solemnity with which he prepared the pot au feu when the lamp was out and florent lay in his bed he was at times very sad he was very anxious to resume his law studies and was trying to arrange his time so that he could follow the course prescribed by the faculty when he at last succeeded in doing this he was very happy but a low fever which kept him ten days in the house was such a drain on his small resources and made him so very anxious that he gave up all idea of finishing his studies his child was growing up and was to be established he succeeded in obtaining a position as professor in a boarding-school in la rue de l'estrapade with a salary of eighteen hundred francs which to him was a fortune with economy he could put aside to establish quenu whom at eighteen he treated as if he were a sister or a daughter for whom a dowry was to be laid aside during his brother's short illness quenu had made his own little reflections and one morning announced that he wished to work that he was old enough to earn his own bread laurent was profoundly touched opposite their room on the other side of the street was a clockmaker whom the boy had found a special fascination in watching seeing him bending over his little table handling delicate tools and toiling patiently all day long quenu therefore declared that this was what he liked but at the end of a fortnight he was in despair wept bitter tears 
and said he could never learn the trade nor remember the thousand nonsensical things in a watch he preferred to be a locksmith but this he found too fatiguing in two years he had tried ten trades laurent agreed to all he said and would not allow him to stick to anything he did not like unfortunately this beautiful devotion on the part of quenu and his desire to earn his bread was rather an expensive thing while he was going from place to place there were new and unforeseen expenses constantly occurring laurent's salary no longer sufficed them and he was compelled to take several pupils in the evening he wore the same overcoat for eight years the two brothers had made a friend the house in which they lived had a façade on la rue st jacques and overlooked a great cook-shop kept by a man named gavard whose wife was dying of consumption when florent came in too late to cook a bit of meat he bought a morsel of turkey or of roast goose for twelve sous this was a great feast gavard at last became much interested in this tall thin fellow whose history he soon learned he took a fancy to quenu who fairly haunted the cook-shop as soon as his brother left home he hastened to his friend and remained there all day watching the huge spits turn slowly before the clear fire the copper saucepans glittered the poultry smoked the lard bubbled in the frying-pans and each spoke to quenu as he with a long-handled spoon in his hand basted the brown breasts of the geese and the turkeys then when the fowls were cooked to a turn and taken from the spit and the skewers drawn out the boy looked on in ecstasy talking to the turkeys telling them that they smelled deliciously and that they should be eaten every mouthful and that the cat should not have even a bone he was perfectly happy when gavard gave him a slice of bread and permission to dip it into the gravy this place was unquestionably where quenu took his fancy for cooking and later after he had tried all trades he came back to that he was afraid that his brother would be displeased as he had rather a contempt for the good things of the table but finding that florent listened patiently while he described some complicated dish he summoned courage to announce his vocation and soon entered the restaurant from that time the life of the two brothers was settled they lived together in the same large room that is they met there each evening and parted again in the morning one with his face gay and bright the other with the downcast look of an overworked professor laurent carefully laid aside his black coat while quenu put on his apron his white jacket and tall cap and busied himself about the fire in the preparation of some dainty never was a menage on more congenial footing the elder brother continued to grow thin burned out by the energy of his father the younger grew plumper and plumper a true son of normandy they loved in each other their common mother that woman who was made up of unselfish tenderness they had in paris one relative a brother of their mother a pork vendor in the quartier des halles he was a coarse miserly fellow who received them as if they were beggars when they first called upon him and they repeated their visits only at rare intervals on the birthday of the old man quenu carried him a bouquet and received ten sous florent suffered tortures while gradelle for this was the name of the uncle examined his threadbare overcoat with the uneasy suspicious look of a man who expects to be asked for a loan of five francs laurent had the simplicity one day to ask his uncle to change a hundred franc note and after this his uncle was less afraid to see the children as he called them come in but their friendship advanced but slowly these years were to florent a long dream a dream that was both sweet and sad he tasted all the bitter pleasure of self-immolation at home he was beloved outside among his pupils where he was subjected to a thousand humiliations he felt himself becoming embittered and thoroughly wicked his ambition which he thought dead leaped again into life long months of discipline were needed before he could bow his head and accept poverty and mediocrity eager to escape temptation he threw himself into an ideal goodness and created for himself a refuge of justice and absolute truth it was then he became a republican as despairing girls become nuns and as he could find no republic which would drown his woes he created one books no longer charmed him all that blackened paper in the midst of which he lived recalled to him his ill-smelling classroom the chewed paper balls flung about by the boys and long wearisome hours 
books only spoke to him of revolt and awakened his ambition and pride while he felt the most imperative need of peace and rest to dream of happiness and of the realization of his dreams was his one recreation the occupation of his leisure hours he read no more than was demanded by the duties of his profession he took long walks through the outer boulevards devising all the time certain measures and humanitarian devices which would change this suffering town into a city of the blessed when the days of february steeped paris in blood he rushed about and became one of those orators who preach revolution as if it were a new religion all sweetness and redemption it needed the dark december days to change this universal tenderness he allowed himself to be taken with the spirit of a lamb and was treated like a wolf when he awoke from a dream of a sermon on fraternity he was suffering the pangs of hunger on the cold stones of a casemate at bicetre quenu who was then twenty-two was filled with mortal anguish when his brother did not return and the next morning went to the montmartre cemetery to look for him among the dead who were covered with straw all but their heads he was blinded by tears at this horrible sight at the end of a week he heard that his brother was a prisoner but he could not see him on his persisting he was threatened with arrest himself he then went to find uncle gradel and implored him to save florent but uncle gradel flew into a passion and declared that it served the fellow right he had no business to get mixed up with those republicans and added that he always knew that florent would turn out badly for it was written on his face quenu wept his eyes out and would not go away his uncle was a little ashamed then and felt as if he must do something for this poor boy and proposed that he should come to him he needed an assistant quenu dreaded to return to his great empty room and accepted the offer made by his uncle he slept in a little dark closet where he could hardly stretch himself out but he wept less than he would have done had his brother's empty bed stared him in the face he succeeded finally in seeing florent but on returning from his first visit to bicetre he was taken ill and was kept in bed for three weeks this was his first and only attack of illness gradel cursed his republican nephew in his heart and when he one morning heard that he had been sent to cayenne he rushed to quenu awoke him roughly to convey this intelligence which had such an effect on the young man that the next day he was on his feet a month later and he laughed though angry with himself that he did so but after a little he laughed as of yore he learned all the art of cooking pork he liked nothing better than to be in the kitchen uncle gradel told him that few cooks knew how to manage pork and that he could teach him many a secret as the young man was really useful to him gradel began to like him after his own fashion he sold the poor furniture of la rue royer collard for forty francs and kept the money for he said that spendthrift quenu would only throw it out of the window he ended by giving him six francs each month for pocket money quenu cramped for money and almost brutalized was very happy for he had made a friend at his uncle gradel's who when he lost his wife had engaged a girl to assist at the counter he selected one that was good-looking knowing that his choice would be another attraction to his shop he knew in la rue cuvier near the jardin des plantes a widow lady whose husband had been postmaster at plassans this lady who lived upon a very small income had brought from that town a pretty child whom she treated like her own daughter lisa took care of her adopted mother with calm serenity if she were a little too serious she was very beautiful when she smiled her great charm was in this rare smile then her very look was a caress the old lady often said that a smile from lisa would tempt her to follow her to the infernal regions when an attack of asthma carried her off she left to the child of her adoption all her savings about ten thousand francs lisa was a week alone in the little apartment in la rue cuvier and it was there that gradel went to look for her he knew her from having seen her when the lady with whom she resided paid him an occasional visit at the funeral he was quite struck by her beauty and as they were lowering the coffin it suddenly occurred to him that she would be quite superb behind his counter he went a week later to make her an offer he promised her thirty francs a month with board she asked for twenty-four hours for consideration 
and at the end of that time she arrived with her little bundle and her ten thousand francs sewed into her corset a month later she ruled the house gradelle quenu and the smallest of the scullions quenu in particular would have cut off his fingers for her lisa who was the eldest child of a macaw at plassans had a father living but she never heard from him she mentioned more than once that her mother when living had been a hard-working woman and that she was like her she was indeed very industrious she talked too of the duties of a wife and of a husband in such a sensible way that quenu was quite charmed he told her he had precisely the same ideas which were simply that everybody ought to work that each individual has his happiness in his own hands that to encourage idleness is to encourage sin this was an out-and-out -out condemnation of drunkenness the besetting sin of the old macaw unknown to herself it was a real macaw that spoke in her a reasonable logical settled macaw who had found out the best way to sleep comfortably is to make one's own bed she gave to this consideration much time and much thought when she was only six years old she would sit still the whole day long on the promise of being rewarded by a cake at night at gradelle's lisa continued to live her calm methodical life she had not accepted the good man's proposition without mature deliberation she needed a home and a protector and felt certain that a future would be open to her a solid comfortable future a life of healthy enjoyment and regular work without fatigue or responsibility she took care of her counter in the conscientious way in which she had discharged all her duties at the postmaster's widow before long the cleanliness and whiteness of lisa's aprons were a proverb in the quartier uncle gradelle was so pleased that he said sometimes to quenu as he chopped his sausages upon my word if i were not over sixty i would marry that girl a woman like that my boy is worth a fortune in trade quenu drank all this in but he laughed nevertheless one fine day when a neighbor accused him of being in love with lisa they were very good friends the girl occupied next to the closet where the youth slept a room which she had made very pretty with the light paper and muslin curtains they stood on the landing talking a few minutes and then parted with a cheerful good night quenu heard lisa moving about the partition wall was so thin that he could hear every sound and when he heard the bed crack after she had put out her candle he said to himself mademoiselle lisa is not a feather by any means this went on for a year in the morning the girl would greet the young man without the smallest embarrassment and would often help him in his work they would each taste the sausages to ascertain if they were highly enough seasoned her judgment was good and she had several excellent receipts from the south which he tried with great success in the afternoons when there were no customers in the shop they talked quietly together she sat behind her counter knitting and he on a log of wood near by the two understood each other to perfection they talked a little of cooking then of uncle gradelle and exchanged a little harmless gossip about the quartier she told him stories as she would to a child she knew any quantity and wonderful legends also full of lambs and angels which she repeated in a sweet flute-like voice and with her solemn little manner at eleven o'clock they lighted their candles and marched upstairs side by side at the doors of their rooms they would stop good night mademoiselle lisa good night monsieur quenu one morning uncle gradelle was struck down by an apoplectic fit while preparing a galantine lisa did not lose her self-possession she said he must not lie there in the middle of the kitchen then she stated to every one that the uncle had died in his bed where she and quenu laid him had the truth been known their customers would have been disgusted and left them quenu obeyed all her instructions in a dull stupor later he and lisa wept together he was the sole heir he and his brother florent the gossips in the neighbourhood looked on old gradelle as a man of wealth but the truth was that not a silver piece could they find lisa was very uneasy quenu saw her looking about as if she had lost something finally she decided on a grand cleaning one afternoon she had been in the cellar for a couple of hours and came up with something in her apron quenu was busy and she waited until he had finished what he was doing and talked with him in an indifferent tone but her eyes were very bright 
she smiled her rare smile and said she wished to speak to him she climbed the staircase with difficulty her movements hampered by the burden she carried in her apron at the top she was obliged to sit down and breathe quenu in considerable astonishment followed her into her room it was the first time he had ever crossed the threshold she closed the door and dropping the corners of her apron which her stiffened fingers could no longer hold she let fall on her bed a perfect rain of gold and silver she had found in the bottom of a salting tub uncle gradelle's treasure the two young people sat down on the bed and looked at this pile which they began to count there were forty thousand francs in gold three thousand in silver and shut up in a tin box forty-two thousand in banknotes they were two good hours in making this calculation quenu's hands trembled but lisa was perfectly calm when they named the sum total eighty-five thousand francs naturally they began to talk of their future and of their marriage though there had never been any allusion made to it before this money seemed to untie their tongues and they sat talking until dusk when lisa started and blushed the bed was all in disorder the gold lay heaped on the pillow between them they started up in as much confusion as if they had committed some great fault then lisa got her ten thousand francs which quenu wished to add to his uncle's money it was agreed that lisa should keep it all together for a while in her wardrobe she locked it up straightened out the bed and the two went quietly downstairs they were exactly like husband and wife with their common interests the marriage took place the next month and the quartier thought it was the most natural thing in the world there was a vague rumour of the finding of the treasure and lisa's honesty was a subject of endless eulogy after all she need never have told quenu she could have kept the money as no one had seen it of course quenu ought to marry her he was a lucky dog to be sure to have such a handsome wife and one too who had found a fortune for him lisa smiled when she heard any of these whispers she and her husband lived much as they had done before like two friends rather than as married lovers lisa however was too intelligent a woman not to understand the folly of allowing these eighty-five thousand francs to rest quietly in the drawer of her wardrobe quenu would have liked to put them back into the salting tub and when they had made as much more retired to suresnes a place they both liked but she had very different ideas la rue pirouette was offensive to her ideas of cleanliness she wanted air sunshine and light the shop where uncle gradelle had amassed this treasure sou by sou was a dark hole so to speak of which many are to be found in old paris permeated with the smell of grease and cooking in spite of all the soap and water which may be lavished upon them and lisa dreamed of one of the modern shops with large panes of glass she had no desire to play the lady behind the counter she had a very clear idea of the duties of the position she wished to undertake quenu was much startled the first time she spoke of moving and spending a portion of their money in decorating a shop she shrugged her shoulders with a smile one evening at twilight before the shop was lighted the husband and wife heard one woman say to another before their door no indeed i will not go there i would not buy an inch of black pudding of them they had had a death in their kitchen quenu was ready to weep for this was a sorry bit of intelligence to get about this it was in fact which finally reconciled him to the idea of moving his wife at once occupied herself with the new shop she had found one in an excellent situation the halles were opposite their custom would soon be quadrupled and their place would be known throughout paris quenu allowed himself to be drawn into mad expenditures and put thirty thousand francs into marble mirrors and gilding lisa spent hours with the workmen discussing the most trivial details when at last all was completed and she took her seat behind the counter the whole world flocked in merely to see the shop there was a large amount of white marble there were huge mirrors and glittering chandeliers suggesting an indefinite number of rooms all filled with good things to eat on the right was a wide counter of white and pink marble a repetition of the floor which had in addition a border in a wide pattern of deep red the whole quartier took pride in this pork shop 
and for a month people stood still on the sidewalk to contemplate it and to catch a glimpse of lisa her beautiful pink and white skin was as wonderful as the tints of the marble she was the master spirit or rather the goddess the stately and solid idol of the shop and went by the name of la belle lisa on the right of the entrance was the dining-room always kept in the most delicate order with a buffet a table and cane seated chairs the inlaid floor and the paper on the walls both pale yellow the room was a little cold in tone brightened as it was only by a brass hanging lamp with its porcelain shade over the centre of the table a door from the dining-room opened into the large square kitchen at the end of which was a small flagged courtyard which served as a place to put pots and kettles which were past use boxes and barrels on the left of the fountain and by the side of the gutter which carried off the dirty water were a few pots of flowers withered and dying business prospered quenu who had been considerably startled at the magnitude of his wife's ideas ended by admitting her cleverness and wisdom in five years they had a comfortable little sum of eighty thousand francs well invested lisa said they were not ambitious that they were in no haste to grow rich they were young still they had plenty of time before them and they wished to take their comfort as they went along now added lisa in an hour of expansion i have a cousin in paris i never see him the two families are not on terms he has taken the name of saccard as he wanted certain things forgotten well i am told that this cousin makes millions but he is always in a hurry hardly stops to eat his dinner i don't call that living we know what we eat and we enjoy it i can see no use in money except for what it buys as to piling one pence on another i would sooner fold my arms and sit still i should like to see my cousin's millions though for i do not quite believe in them i saw him the other day in a carriage and he was as yellow as a lemon and looked perfectly overwhelmed with care of course this is his own affair but we think very differently End of chapter 2, part 1